Oh, we, one of the things we do to try to make some, try to get some folks, um, Amber, just, you, you've got your MFA at where, Columbia? Uh, Northwestern. Northwestern. Yeah. Um, it just came back to town. Um, that's how we ended up um, collaborating on this stuff. So one of the things we try to do at all of our readings is get folks that are young in their career or at the start of their career to introduce them. Uh, ben is on the other end of that spectrum. <laughs> we, we just had a discussion about bifocals, so that's cool. <laughs> but only one of us has them, which is me and not him. Uh, so, Ben, uh, I met uh, a couple, I don't know, six months, seven months ago uh, at one of the jams, and a bunch of people from Chicago came down, um, and he actually won the event, didn't win anything, but won the event. <laughs> Uh, and we've gotten just to be friends with the curbside splendor folks up in Chicago. He has some books back there. He was just promoted into the non-paying in the uh, book publishing world. Yeah. What do you do now? What is it? Acquisition. Acquisitions. Um, but the curbside stuff is great. And everybody up there is wonderful. I have such a good time when I go up to Chicago with them. So I'm very happy Ben was in town for business. We actually set this up because he was in town. He's got a new book that seems to be everywhere. Every like see, lots of people seem to be writing about it, reviewing it, you know, doing things. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's called New York Stories. It's a short story collection. I can't introduce what it is because it's not gonna be the thing that he told me what it's gonna be, so I'm gonna let him do his thing. So okay. Ben Tanner from Chicago. I really appreciate all of you being here and I really appreciate Brad putting this together. And I did mess it up because then when I got your email you're like well, tell more of a story than I thought. Well, that's not necessarily a story that I would tell a story about. So I apologize. Uh, I just want to thank the readers. I found both those pieces, all those pieces that both was reading really moving and got me excited about words. So uh, I very much appreciate that. Um, it's great to be back in Indianapolis. I appreciate all of you coming out. Um, this is a New York Stories. Um, I do have books. My publisher has probably got a chip in my brain somewhere. So to be clear, we are selling books. And I would be thrilled to sell them and take any questions anything else. Um, I did do this book, as Brad said, with Chicago Center for Literature and Photography, also known as C-Clap. I just think it's the worst name ever. <laughs> <laughs> my day job is communications and branding. And even though I'm a huge fan of material disease, I don't quite, I don't quite get what the intention was here. But uh, anyway, it has been a very fruitful relationship for me regardless and just to clarify one thing Brad said I also on the side oversee acquisitions for curbside splendor which is the Chicago publisher which is terrific I did an essay collection with them about a year ago and then along the way the founder was like maybe you could help us out because of your day job stuff so I am both one of their authors and now one of their employees and now I'm sort of a former author as more books come out but I am involved in helping pick books as the publisher grows. What's the name of it? Lost in? Lost in Space. I have a couple of copies of that. I'm pitching the hell out of it. I apologize. So it's a know. great book. It's the best book on fatherhood I've ever read. That's very ever. generous. The funny part is it's an essay collection about fatherhood, something I am a father, uh, but something I never planned to write about. But the, the founder of the press had asked me to do that. And what's funny is, is that people now treat it as a book about fatherhood and parenting, and it's sort of a manual, whereas no. I see it as a collection no. of neuroses. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> I see it as a collection of neuroses in an effort not to kill children, which, you know, is important because my day job is all about not killing children. So, um, <laughs> it was I also happen to have an almost 14-year-old, and whenever I raise my voice even this much, he says, child abuse. <laughs> he's very good. He says it in a very low voice, so to really let the effect sit there. And I used to respond very badly to that. And I think, I'm glad you don't know what abuse is, which is the worst parental response. <laughs> so now I say, now I say, that's how you define abuse? Awesome. And I encourage you to call it in. My dad slightly raised his voice because I yelled at him first. I think that's going to be an awesome discussion to have. <laughs> anyway, uh, you know, this book just came out a couple of weeks ago, and I'm really proud of it. And I just want to give a little background because this is a storytelling thing. But um, I did not write a single word as an adult until I was 30 years old. Um, hence the need for my vocals because I'm no longer 30. But I had been thinking about it for a really, really long time. And, um, you know, I even once took a class in college on creative writing, a one-time thing, the only class I had ever taken on writing, which may be reflected in my writing, but um, I absolutely hated it, and I hated the people in that class, and, and now I realize that that's what people call a workshop. I just had no idea. I just signed up, 
blindly and fit my schedule. I was dying to try and learn how to write. I absolutely hated it. But there was one really amazing thing. I am from upstate New York, small town. Not as small as where Amber grown. Wow. Good for you. I'm sure we still have more people on my block than you had in your whole town. But I think of it as small and it continues to shrink, which is more amazing. But um, anyway, I, uh, I share that I'm from upstate New York because they're upstate New York stories so from any small town. These are probably your stories too. But I want to share something. I am married uh, to a woman from Long Island, which is a much different vibe than the one I grew up with. But I share that particularly if you have any association to that. Um, because in this writing class, I absolutely hated it. I'm going to come back to this and put it all together for you. There was a woman um, who was clearly from Long Island, so really stood out in this class as like an oddball, which is amazing because the school uh, was mostly Jewish and mostly Long Island, but not this class. And um, I am very Jewish, but not Long Island. But anyway, she every week came in with a nonfiction piece. Everyone else was writing fiction. I didn't even know nonfiction was. I don't know what I knew, uh, because I read a lot of books, but I never read essays or nonfiction. Apparently, I'm not male in that way. Um, and so I only shared that, so I'm going to come back to that in a second. She wrote nonfiction every week, and her pieces were so moving. Every single week, she came in with the hair and the clothes, and they just killed these stories. And so I'm telling you that because when I finally, finally, finally started writing, um, I could not get anything published. I mean, not for years and years. I'd say at least three to five. Do we have writers in the room? Writers in the room? Okay, so I would say minimally I didn't publish a single thing for three to five years, but I was writing it every day. Um, and then I thought of this woman, this woman I did not know from college, and I thought maybe nonfiction is a thing. So for about a year I tried to write nonfiction, and that was my first stuff that got picked up. So of course, since that was getting picked up, I immediately deserted it. And I started thinking, because in my head I was supposed to write fiction. And um, I started thinking, how do people get fiction published? And I had no idea. And I didn't know any writers. I mean, I literally at that point knew no one. I would go to readings and I was like a stalker or like a vampire. And I would, people know, people know Elizabeth Crane? So she's a major or somewhat major short story writer. In Chicago, she's a legitimate goddess. And I was obsessed with her in a super non-stalkery way. Um, but she was still in Chicago. And she is coincidentally from my hometown. And she blurred the final version of this book because we became friends after the stalking part of the relationship ended. Um, but you know, people like her, I would go watch do readings. And she had a book that came out um, called When the Messenger is Hot. Do you know that one? That really blew her up for her. And I had read that, and I had actually bought it for my wife, and she kept leaving it on her side of the bed. And then I went to a reading, and there was the author of that book. I hadn't even made the connection. It was the same person. And um, I read the book and just devoured it. And then I read Drown. People read Drown, Juno Diaz. Awesome. And then I read um, what we talk about when we talk about love, which absolutely blew my head off. And I started thinking, maybe the idea with fiction is not to just write whatever's on your mind, per se, but maybe you should write like a group of stories that all hang together. And I, I went to social work schools, but hanging together is a big thing. So I started thinking about stories that might look like they're from the same place at the same time. And so I wrote a bunch of stories that nobody wanted, and in my head deserved to be published together. Um, called repetition patterns, and nobody wanted them, which is great. Um, but, but, this is important, maybe. Um, as I was writing them, I wrote one more essay, and I sent that essay to another Chicago magazine. Do people know that one? ACM? It's awesome. Been around for like 50 years. I was obsessed with getting something into another Chicago magazine. I had three, in my mind, if I ever got published, and I had never been published, I was going to somehow get a piece of another Chicago magazine. Punk Planet. Do people remember Punk Planet, or am I really old? You're really old. Damn. Okay, just Google Punk Planet. You know, <laughs> by far the greatest magazine to emerge from a college dorm room in history. Um, and then I really want to get something into the, into the second hand, which was another lit mag in Chicago in the '90s, and everyone seems so cool with getting published there. So they were on my list. So some of these pieces made in the second hand, which I'm thrilled about. Um, I did get into Punk Planet. Finally, I could not get into another Chicago magazine. So. As I was putting this group of stories together, one of them actually won a contest, um, which I don't even, I, it was kind of you actually had to mail it in back then. The internet was very minimal. And uh, I had to write a check, and I got a call, and it's about 10 years ago, maybe 11. And I got a call, and I said, hey, you won this contest. Do people know Cake Train? East Coast Magazine. So Cake Train, I had won their fiction contest, and uh, they said it was going to be a reading at AWP. Do people know AWP? 
I had never heard of it. I mean, I literally had no idea what it was, and 20,000 people go. Uh, but of course, I didn't know any writers anyway. And so I said, sure, I'd love to cover you at AWP, whatever that is. Where is it? They said, it's Austin. <laughs> and I said, okay, I've heard of Austin. And then um, my wife was like, go for one night. We had like a six month old. I said, okay, I'm gonna go just, I'm just gonna fly to Austin. Like back then, we were both working and the tickets were cheap. And again, I didn't even know what it was. And when I got there, there was like a whole like uh, magazine, what do you call it? Like uh, all the people with their tables and all these oh, magazines. Yeah, the book fair. The book fair, thank you. That's what they call it, bizarre. Um, it was like a whole book fair, it was like a Grateful Dead thing. And, and uh, I just was like wandering around in the days. I only had like three hours. I had to do the reading, go to sleep, and fly back home. And so I went to the book fair, and there was another Chicago magazine. And uh, I didn't know the editor, but the head editor was there. I'm now friends with him. And I said, hey, I sent you this essay. He's like, oh, yeah, I love that essay. I go, really? He said, yeah, we're not going to publish it, though. Yeah. <laughs> and I said, no. He goes, no. He goes, why don't you do a short story for us, just for us? I said, OK. And he said, and before you write that short story, I want you to do two things. I want you to read DJ Grease Pancake. People know him, West Virginia short story writer, killed himself. Um, in his 20s, but he put out one book, which is Dynamite, and he told me to read Ha Jin. Am I pronouncing that right? People know Ha Jin, short story writer, Chinese American, well, born in China, now lives here. He said, read those two collections and then write us a story. So I had already started a story, and um, I literally went back to the hotel room and started writing, and they did not publish that story. Um, <laughs> what we thought we knew, but I still sent it to him, and I still read those, so I'm going to start with this story because. It became part of this collection of stories that never found a home. And then the other night I was at a reading and one of my writer friends was like, dude, you ever read what we thought we knew? And I said, no, I never read things. Like, fucking read that one. So this is the not published, <laughs> this is the not published another Chicago magazine story, what we thought we knew. These were the facts about Lacey Chalmers as we understood them. She had short blonde hair, long skinny legs, green eyes, and shoulders that were perpetually stuck forward because she was embarrassed about her height. She had non-existent breasts, was a solid but unremarkable member of the varsity volleyball team, and had a smile that would sometimes come out of nowhere and suddenly light up the room. She wasn't cute per se, and she wasn't not cute either. She was what she was, and I guess for the most part, we just didn't really think about her in any other way. Lacey's birth had not been planned, and her parents were not young. Her father, Frank, was in his 60s when she was born, and her mother, Annie, was in her 40s. They had not intended to have children at all. And they didn't even really sleep together anymore, except for the occasional birthday or anniversary celebration. Frank, however, had been regularly banging his youngish blonde secretary, Mary, that she had gotten pregnant. Mary did not want to keep the baby. But Annie talked Frank into talking Mary into having it. I want to raise him as our own, she told Frank, in a way that made it clear that he had no choice. Lacey was born. Lacey was in the key club, and she was a member of the Honor Society. She had her heart set on attending Williams College and had no second choice in mind. Lacey and Frank played golf together on a public course twice a month when the weather was good, and Lacey and Annie watched the movie Mermaids together over and over again. <laughs> While Frank may have moments where he thought, why is Lacey around at all? She's just a reminder of things he wished he hadn't done. And while Annie may have kind of wanted Frank to think just that, there was still a happy, quiet house where people went about their business undisturbed. Lacey would have dated more, but people didn't ask her. She did have her admirers, though. There was Ted, for example. He had the perpetually bad skin, bad hair, and Harvard ambitions. Ted didn't get out much. While it was clear this was due in part to his study habits, as well as his penchant for Dungeons and Dragons, <laughs> the fact was his family was unusually close. And his father, Jonathan, liked to have Ted and his brothers in the house doing family things when he wasn't at work. This seemed odd to the rest of us. No one's family spent time together. But Jonathan was from Australia, and none of us knew how they operated down there. <laughs> when we were eight, when we were eight, and long before I had begun to truly worry about being cool, much less being around those I perceived to be cool, Ted invited me to sleep over at his house. We didn't spend that much time together, but the fact that he had just received a copy of the new Asteroids cartridge for his Atari trumped everything else. And we played until our thumbs were swollen and our eyes were blurry. At some point, Jonathan told us it was time to go to bed. And after Ted kissed Jonathan on the cheek, I started following him upstairs. Jonathan, with pale blotchy skin, 
and thin, wispy hair that hung across his face, looked at me, looked at Ted, and smiled and said, no one goes to bed in this house without first giving me a kiss goodnight. If I paused, it was brief. Of course, her request seemed odd to me because it was Ted's dad asking for a kiss and not say, Ted's mom. <laughs> we never saw much of it anyway. But at that age, I would have never seriously questioned adult overtures of any kind. It would never have occurred to me to do so. I quickly kissed Jonathan on the cheek and the oddness passed. The next morning, when my dad came to pick me up and asked me how the sleepover had gone, I didn't say anything there about kissing Jonathan goodnight. I didn't say anything at all, really, but it didn't matter, because he was already thinking about other things. I like a family that spends time together, my dad said, and I like seeing a father who seems to value that. I didn't respond to that either. Our family didn't spend time together. It was safe to say that it wasn't going to change anytime soon. Then again, what did I know about my parents? Nothing. They lived in a different world than we did. I never slept at Ted's again, though. But then again, never planned on it either. At some point, I think he just stopped inviting people to stay over. And if that is true, it didn't matter to us anyway. Ted wasn't that cool. And we were finally old enough to know that mattered. What we also knew was that Ted was in love with Lacey. And while she tried to keep her distance, he knew that after he convinced her to go to prom with him, she would love him back. In fact, Ted was so sure they would end up together, he had already memorized the directions between Harvard and Williams. Because he also knew that he was going to be making that drive quite often. The way Ted envisioned it, if he could find a good enough route, he'd be able to make it to Lacey's campus late on Friday afternoons, right before rush hour started. And if she had a class, he'd just wait for her at the student union to do his homework. When she was ready, they would have an early dinner before heading back to her room, where they would spend the rest of the weekend together lying in bed, reading, writing long romantic letters to each other, making love. Ted knew these things would happen because he knew that nobody understood Lacey like he did. Certainly no one had studied her quite like he had. But that made sense because no one else felt quite the same about her. For example, did anyone else know that she drew Barry Manel's picture over and over again when she was upset about things? Probably not. But they probably hadn't watched her during study hall quite as intensely as he had. Did anyone else know the route she took to get home from school? The exact route, including the wall she walked along, the backyard she cut through, the bushes she jumped over? <laughs> Definitely not. <laughs> but who else had followed her home repeatedly? <laughs> from a safe distance. No one. That's who. Nor did anyone else know that late at night when everyone else was asleep, she violently danced to the Ramones in front of her bedroom window. But how could they? How many of them had actually witnessed it? Ted had never even kissed Lacey, but he knew he would. Because while Ted had never discussed the prom with her, he knew it was just a matter of time before he did. And once he did, he knew Lacey would go with him. They were meant to be together. And that he knew without doubt. One night, there was a party at Johanna Levy's house. Johanna's parents were never home on weekends. And some of you count on like clockwork. You also knew you could always count on someone's older brother or sister buying you beer, and that at some point the combination of the party and the alcohol would provide you with a chance to hook up with someone. There might only prove to be a small window of opportunity to do so, but there would definitely be one at some point. Something we knew to be true regardless of how successful we actually were. Oddly enough, Lacey was at Johanna's that night. They were not friends, but they were neighbors, all the way back from being kids, and nothing particularly negative had ever occurred between them. Like Ted and I, Johanna and Lacey had gone on in different directions at some point. You weren't sure why, but you knew that Lacey was Lacey, that she wasn't cool. So you knew it had nothing to do with that, or maybe everything to do with that. You just didn't want to admit it. When I first saw Lacey, she was at the keg. We were not that friendly, but we weren't unfriendly, and she always had a smile for me. Hey there, she said a little unsteadily. It's going to be my birthday at midnight. No oh, shit, I said. Great. Happy birthday. <laughs> yeah, she said, nodding to the music. So, you know, maybe you'll give me a kiss at midnight. <laughs> sure, I said, taking it back. Anything you want. Cool. <laughs> cool, she said, still nodding, suddenly walking without saying anything. She was joking, of course. Had to be. Or else she was so wasted she would never remember the conversation <laughs> by the time midnight rolled around. 
I didn't even consider actually kissing her later. But I would. I definitely would if she wanted to. If she asked. If she remembered it. At midnight, I felt a tap on my shoulder was Lacey. You didn't think I was joking, did you? Yeah, kind of. We barely speak. And whose fault is that, she said. We remained silent for a moment, and she said, are you going to kiss me or what? I leaned in towards her, and she responded in kind. Her lips were warm, electric, like fresh fruit. We started to kiss, slowly, softly, and faster, harder. I pushed into her, and she moved with me. I buried my hands in her hair, and she grabbed my neck, pulling me closer to her. And then closer still, I paused. I was panicked by how intense it all was. I pulled back. She smiled. Thanks, she said. <laughs> <laughs> and then she walked away. And that was the moment I became a lifelong admirer of hers, though always from afar. Lacey had one other admirer as well, Mr. Elmore, the music teacher, who was youngish and desperate to be hip, with his longish prog rock hair and his tasteful little beard. <laughs> he was married to a younger woman of indeterminate Asian descent, who never left their little house was rumored to hand stitch his mainly hemp clothes. <laughs> it was said that they spent their weekends getting together with other faculty couples from the local college, getting high, watching porn, and swapping wives. But no one could confirm this. What we could confirm was that Mr. Elmo's slightly pudgy frame squinted a lot. And we knew that because each and every time we had music class, we would have to watch his hand stitch hemp clothes become saturated over the course of an hour. Uh, <laughs> true. <laughs> we also knew, or we thought we knew, that he seemed to like young girls. And it wasn't because he clearly smiled more when they raised their hand, that he liked to rub their shoulders during class, or even how he was forever offering the girls ride home from school in his beat up BW Carmen Gia. <laughs> but you know, he just happened to be going that way. No, it was the way he looked at them when they didn't know it, like a panhandler staring through the window of a restaurant at a hot, open faced turkey sandwich. There was a raw hunger in his eyes when he thought no one was looking at desperate, churning desire to devour the girls in our class in one huge cartoonish bite. And we knew, at least we heard anyway, that Mr. Elmo was nasty in other schools for exactly this kind of stuff, and that his wife was in fact a former student of his. A woman who had gone on to be a student teacher and found her first husband in bed with another man. Everyone knew this. It was the word around the school. And if the information wasn't entirely accurate, there was certainly no one around who actually disputed. Of course, that was what we thought we knew. What we didn't know is that Lacey had slept with Mr. Elmo. It had happened on a class trip to Quebec that Mr. Elmo had chaperoned. Mr. Elmo had plied her with raspberry wine coolers one night and told her how beautiful she was. Had told her that he was lonely and that his wife didn't understand him or his dreams of being a full-time musician. His dreams of getting out of the endless rut of teaching a bunch of someone spoiled teams who give a shit about art or beauty or anything. Lacey was impressed. And she admitted that her parents didn't understand her either. <laughs> <laughs> Why do we go all the way to Williams, they would say? Why not stay with us? We love you. Aren't we all happy here? I ruined that. That's exactly why I want to get away, she told me. I feel smothered. I know. I know, Mr. Elmo said. Like, just loving someone isn't enough. They need to understand your dreams as well and support those dreams. Without that, how can you even call it love? Totally, Lacey said. You really get me, don't you? Oh, I do, Mr. Elmo said. I really do. Moments after they were done having sex, Mr. Elmo said, You should probably leave my room now. <laughs> You don't want me here, Lacey said? Well, I kind of do. And I'm a chaperone. And you're a student. He ran his fingers down her cheek. You don't want me to get in trouble, do you? And she didn't, so she left. The next day, when Lacey tried to walk with Mr. Elmo through the local history of Labor Museum, he kept finding various ways to ensure that the two were never left alone. He remained this way for the rest of the trip. And when returning home, the incident was never spoken about again. While we did not know that Lacey slept with Mr. Elmo, what we also didn't know was that Ted had gone on the trip to Quebec to be near Lacey. That he had followed Lacey to Mr. Elmo's room and listening to everything that went down. Nor did we know how much rage Ted felt about life in general those days, that he cut himself regularly, 
tortured small animals, from stories of mutilation and violence, he feverishly hid away in a box under his bed. If we had known this, we might not have been so surprised at eventually learning that Ted burned down Mr. Romo's house. But we didn't know these things, just like we didn't know why Ted's Australian father was so gung ho on being inside the house with his sons all those years. We didn't know he'd been sexually abusing them. We didn't even know such things happened. Not really, anyway. And the fact that Ted was essentially left off on juvenile probation, the fact that Mr. Elmo and his wife quietly moved away a few weeks later, the fact that Ted's father permanently left the country the year after that, the fact that Lacey did not get into Williams after all, none of that seemed to mean all that much when everything else was said and done. What we thought we knew wasn't very important, because the fact was, you didn't know shit, and you never do. Thank you. I appreciate that. So I'm going to wrap this up in a way. But what I want to say is I did these stories, and they went nowhere, which is where this story started. And uh, I was lucky enough in 2007 to have a book come out, um, which really sounds like a humble brag. I'm sorry. But uh, anyway. <laughs> Maybe you'll feel better. It didn't sell any copies and nobody read it. But um, <laughs> the book was Lucky Man. And um, the one, one of the only people who didn't read it in the entire known universe was the person who found it. Clap. Ugh. Anyway. <laughs> it's just sticky and wrong. But um, anyway, he called me in the middle of the night, which is, I guess what people do. And uh, he said he wanted to interview me and talk about the book. And then later he said, I'm thinking of starting a publishing way have anything that's like Lucky Man. And I said, I've got this group of stories that have never gotten any traction. So I sent him those stories. And that is this first group of stories in this collection, um, Repetition Patterns. And then he published those as an E version. And then about a year later, um, he called me up and he said, you know, people are starting to do blog tours. Would you do a blog tour? And I said, sure. I didn't know what that was, though I was a regular blogger. And so I started answering questions about this collection that once nobody had paid any attention to. And as I was taking notes and thinking, I started thinking, maybe there's another group of stories. You know, maybe the first group of stories is really about the sins of the father. And maybe there could be another group of stories about what it looks like when the chickens come home to roost or some cliche like that. And so I started jotting down notes. What would those stories look like? And how would those stories connect to the first set of stories? So how would you continue this idea of integration? And one of the stories in the first collection was about a boy um, and his alcoholic father who did not live at home. And uh, what's really amazing is I did, I did not have an alcoholic father. I did have a father who did not always live at home. Um, but people have taken that story, which I guess I have talked about over the years, and um, called Shooting Stick. And people are always like, I'm glad we have that thing in common. And I go, the dead dad thing? My father's not passed away. They go, no, not the dead dad thing. And I go, the dad who didn't live at home all the time thing? They go, no, no, the drinking dad thing. My dad never had a drink. So, and he wasn't a teetotaler, he just didn't drink. So somehow that story has taken on some nonfiction angle, which does not exist. Um, but anyway, I wrote that story about this relationship between this little boy and his father. And then I thought in the second collection, and this is brief, maybe I'd revisit it. Because that was my idea, revisit. So here is the son, now a young man, and uh, still hanging out with his father. And still shooting pool. The shooting stick was the phrase my dad now used. He was a rock star, pool player, which helps me drop out of high school and you play pool. Um, anyway, this is the father several years later. This is a story called Know Nothing. It's short, and I'm going to finish with something more uplifting, I promise. But anyway, I look at him across the pool table. He's trying to line up his shot, but his hands are shaking, and he's unstable on his feet. It occurs to me that I could put my coffee down and just walk over to him. I could grasp him by his shoulders and grip his elbow offering him support so he could actually take the shot. I even picture myself doing this, but I don't do it. I don't move. I watch him struggle. Well, I'm not exactly enjoying myself. I'm also not feeling anything. Not what I could be feeling anyway. Fuck him. He takes his shot, the pool cue sliding off of his finger and skidding across the table, the chalk dust curling into the light before drifting away. My dad shakes his head and smiles. Can you believe that shit? When he takes a seat, I don't say anything. You hate me, he says sadly. Do I hate him? No. No, I don't. Should I hate him for leaving my mom and me? 
for preferring bars to Little League games, for being so sick now after a mostly wasted life? I don't know. I'm way past caring about that stuff. What about the time he checked himself out of Two Rivers General and walked barefoot all the way to my high school just to wait for me in his rumpled suit and bloody feet as everybody was leaving for the day, hoping to borrow a few dollars? Do I hate him for that? No. Not anymore. I'm numb to that. I'm numb to him. No feelings. No nothing. I feel nothing. I'm dying, my dad says. He looks like hell. Old and beat up, his cheeks all sharp angles, just barely holding on to the sagging skin that looks like it's trying to desperately leave his face. So you keep telling me, I finally said. No, no, Pete boy, this is different, he says. Man, you'll make up any excuse when you can't shoot well, I say. I want to avoid this conversation. It's embarrassing. You're embarrassing, right? I mean, you're embarrassed for yourself, I say. Right? All right, Kitty says. How about you just get me home? I'm tired. I drive him back to his building. We are silent. He pauses by my window. Looks like he's going to say something. And then he shuffles away. Sirens are going off. Or maybe it's an air raid, like when we were kids and we were told to hide under our desk just in case the Russians never decided to bomb us. I try to adjust and I roll out of bed. I realize it's just the phone. It's the middle of the night. And no one ever calls in the middle of the night for a good reason. Hello, I say. It's Two River General. It's the call I've been expecting for hours. I'm at the funeral home. Scotty Dooley Jr. sitting across from me. Scotty Dooley Jr. is a rich kid from the west side of town. And a smug prick who now works in the family business. We went to high school together, and he knows who my dad is. Scotty Jr. and his dad, Scotty Sr., probably saw my dad sleeping outside in the park diner after coming home from church, or scrounging for drink money at town of parties when things were at their worst. Scotty Jr. has always looked down on me, and I've taken it. I had to. My dad is who he is. There's no denying it. Of course, now Scotty Jr. is marrying my dad. That just sucks. Sorry about your dad, he says, with his perfect hair and his perfect fucking teeth, never looking up at the papers on his desk. Bullshit, I think to myself. Thanks, I actually say. Let's talk coffee, Scotty Jr. says. There are a number of possibilities. I'm about to break his heart. Something that offers me some joy. You know, I say, I'm going to build the coffin myself. What? How? That's not how this works. There are laws, he says. From what I understand, I say, lying through my teeth, you just need to give me permission. Do I have it? I need to talk to my dad, Scotty Jr. says. He walks out the room into another office where I hear muffled voices and occasional words like drunk and loser. Scotty comes back with his fake letter and smile. Yeah, that's cool, he says. But we'll need to buy it tomorrow morning. That's fine, I say. I go to the lumber yard, I buy the wood I need, and I stop by the giant supermarket on the way home for a case of gaming. I spend the night in my garage sanding, planting, assembling the coffin. I try not to think about how much I worried about my dad as a kid or how I endlessly sat on the couch by the window waiting for him to come home. I also try not to think about how much I've tried not to think about these things as an adult. By morning, there was a coffin. In my afternoon, there is a funeral. Hardly anyone is there. Just me, some cousin I don't know, a drinking buddy of my dad who leaves as soon as he learns it won't be alcohol. Scotty Jr. standing in the back trying to look professional. The gravesite is on this hill under a tree. The Susquehanna River is off in the distance. It's really pleasant. It's kind of grand. And on the one hand, it's better than my dad deserves. But standing here now like this with him gone, I can't help but feel like he deserved a better life as well. He didn't want to be an alcoholic or a sort of crappy father. He didn't plan to get cancer. So why should he get so pieced out if it's all over? Scotty Jr. tells me the stone won't be done for a couple of days, but I have no need to worry. He will personally see to it gets finished. He then drifts off and I buy myself. I get the last six pack of gingling from my car and I drink one beer after another. Standing over my dad's grave as the sun slowly sets and the baby comes night. I do not cry. Not one drop. I won't give him that. No emotion. No nothing. The days pass. I don't get back to the grave. A couple months later, though, I wander out to the cemetery. Think about how peaceful the site was and how nice it would be to drink a couple of beers there. When I get to the grave, I pop open a yingling and I take a long, cold swallow, my eyes watering up. As I wipe away the tears, I look down at the stone and I see that my dad's name is spelled wrong. Oh. Even in death, he's been fucked. I call Scotty Jr. Oh, he says. 
Hey man, I say, trying to stay disengaged. My dad's name is misspelled on his stone. What? Yeah, I'm sorry about that. We'll fix it as soon as we can. We're really busy right now, though. Is next week cool? Is he kidding? Well, no, I say, trying to stay calm. I'm surprised I'm starting to feel anger, actual anger. It isn't cool. Show some respect, man. Right, of course. I'm sorry. Friday. We'll fix it Friday. Look, I already paid for it. My voice is starting to strain. Come on, what the fuck? Cool, I'm sorry. Tomorrow. It'll be fixed tomorrow. I come back the next day. Not fixed. I feel nothing. I want to feel nothing. I call Scotty and get his secretary. Scotty doesn't call back. Nothing. I call him back. He leaves me a voicemail when I miss his call. Wednesday for sure. Cool. Wednesday comes and goes. My head starts to hurt. That pain like nothing I've ever felt before starts to inch its way up along the back of my neck. I go to the cemetery. No change. No nothing. I know what I need to do. It's oddly calming. I call Scotty and get his voicemail. Hey man, I say as calmly as possible. If you're not here within two hours to fix this, I'm going to come to your office. I'm going to beat the shit out of you. And then when I'm done, I'm going to beat the shit out of your dad. <laughs> Then, maybe your mom if she's there. And then everybody else who works there. Cool. And then I wait there by the grave, drinking beer, and praying all the while that he doesn't make it on time. <laughs> all right. Thank you. Now I'm going to wrap it up on a more uplifting beat. Anyway, two collections, four years apart. And then I made a joke to the publisher. Um, I sound really old and cliche, so they have to humor me. But I made a joke that we would do a third collection if they ever did another, if they ever completed a trilogy for the Before Sunrise series. Do people know that? Oh, Ethan yeah. Hawke, Jane Delby. Yeah. I love that series. My wife hates it. So does my mom. Um, but I made a joke that if they did a third one, maybe we could do a third one. And the publisher laughed. And then like a week later, they were interviewing Ethan Hawke somewhere. He's like, yeah, so we just got out of a hotel room and we just wrote the whole script for the third movie. And I thought, fuck! Um, but, but, at the same time, which is not as humorous, my hometown flooded. It is on a river, and it completely flooded, and I was amazingly distressed by that. I haven't lived there for 25 years, and it never flooded when we were growing up. So I started thinking, what if you had all these characters, and they still lived in that town, and what if it flooded? What would that look like? So for the next year or so, I worked on flood stories. I'm going to give you a very brief flood story. But anyway, all the characters of earlier come back in different ways, including Pete and his dead dad. So do a super brief piece on Pete's. I'm going to wrap it up. So anyway, the publisher agreed, and he said, dude, if you can do a third one, we should just put it out as a proper book. So this is it. Two weeks later, and here we go. This is a piece called Vision. I'm going to revisit Pete, my buddy. OK. What are you building? Joe at the Lumberyard asked me, a slight sign of a smirk crossing his face, his crazy eyes looking as crazy as ever. We both know that I fucked his wife Stacy in high school. And they apparently have a running debate about whether she left him at the time for the sole purpose of doing that, or he left her because she did that and was sick of hearing about it. Regardless, we fucked at a party. She was, <laughs> she was drunk, she was laughing, she was bent over a small fence behind the house, her summer dress floating there in the air. And when we finished, we both smiled. She walked back into Joe's arms, and that was that. <laughs> now they're married, and we occasionally drink together at Thursdays. And when Stacy is really drunk, she likes to talk about that night. <laughs> it's, a, it's a game we play. So, I remember the last one I was with before Joe and I went and got married, Stacy will say. What do you remember? That you were a vision, I say and that I compare everyone I've ever been with since to you. This makes her smile, which makes me happy. Joe, too, apparently. Pete Manning once said to me in a bar, all serious, whatever it is you and Stacy talk about back there, please keep doing it. Those nights are crazy. <laughs> Last time you guys hung out, I ended up having sex with her in our backyard, bent over a fence. <laughs> I mean, that's pretty awesome, right? <laughs> I suppose so. And it's not that I'm lying when I tell her she was a vision or that I compare everyone to her. She was a vision with her creamy skin and her flowing blonde hair. And I have compared everyone to her. That night, 
It's preserved in amber, like a fossil or a time capsule, a perfect little memory where everything else falls short. Every relationship, every woman, everything pales in comparison. And they have to. They are real, and that, that isn't real anymore. Hey man, seriously, Joe says, what's all this wood for? And you think maybe you could come get drinks with us tomorrow night? <laughs> Stacy and I are planning to go out, and I'm sure she'd be happy to see you. I don't know, brother, I said, you know, I'm, I'm trying to take care of you and all, but I really need to work on this thing. Think about it, he says, please. <laughs> of course I say before taking my wood and throwing it in the back of my truck. From there I head out to the cemetery where my dad is buried. It's peaceful here with its sloping hills and trees, the endless skies, the view of the river just past the woods. On a quiet day, you can even hear the water sloshing up on shore, which is nice for when I sleep here, which is often now. I don't know when it started. The first was just a place to come drink and hang out and acknowledge I was never going to escape my father's long shadow. But at some point, being here just seemed better than being anywhere else. Things didn't make sense in other places. They never did, but it's worse now. Now that I can't blame my anger or confusion on his sickly ghost-like presence, it's just me. And the life I didn't make and don't have, and who needs that? I placed an open can of healing on the grass. I lay the two by fours down by the grave side by side and I start to drill. I'm building a platform with a small roof, a place to sleep. And maybe I'll keep a cooler there, a generator, a mattress, a lamp. I can get away with this, but no one really comes here. It's a dying town. And though my dad liked to joke that the cemetery was the only place everyone was dying to get into, even that's not true anymore. Everyone's dying to get out. Well, except me. Joe and Stacy. I drift off, hammer in hand, empty cans and nails scattered everywhere, my work half done at best. I wake at dawn to the plink, plink, plink of rain on my face at first light, and then it gets stronger. I pop a beer and get back to work, drill, hammer, repeat. My platform slowly expanding from something the size of a man could sleep on to something more like a small deck. The rain keeps coming down, it's pouring now, and it's almost impossible to see anything more than a few inches away from my face. I climb into the truck to dry off, and I look out the window, I see for the first time how high the river is, the water swirling and boiling and begging to pour on the shore and beyond. When I turn on the radio, they say it is the storm of the century, that there is no end in sight, and that residents are being encouraged to stay inside their homes, ride it out, and as they want, pray to whoever they pray to. I just pop another mirror and back to work. As I kneel there, the hammer slipping with every strike of a nail, two deer, a bucket of dough, walk out of the woods on the outskirts of the cemetery. They are followed by two skunks and then a pair of raccoons, <laughs> all of them beautifully line up a small distance from the platform. <laughs> I don't make eye contact with them or even treat their presence as anything but normal. Instead, I continue working in this manner even as two brown bears sign up to the others and then a pair of geese take residents on their backs. The rain keeps coming. I keep working. When I finally look at my watch, I see the whole day has passed. I realize that I'm getting very low on wood and that Columbia will be closing soon. I then think about Joe and Stacy. We'll be getting drinks, storm or no storm. And I briefly lose myself in how lovely Stacy is, her kindness, and her still creamy skin merging with something more, more than the woman I've been flirting with since high school. Something earthier, more regal. And after all these years, one of the few people I know how to spend time with at all, I shake my head like an etch a sketch to make her image go away. I wave goodbye to the animals who nod accordingly. And I head down to the little yard where Joe is closing up. Hey, man, he says, his crazy eyes popping. What the fuck are you doing out this weather? This is like end of the world shit. I was working on that thing, I said. I'm sorry, I think I'm going to need more wood. A lot of it. Yeah, well, we're closing, man. Maybe when the storm lets up? Yeah, well, that's, that's not good, I said. It's not going to let up. If I promise to join you guys tonight, can I get some wood? Take all the wood you need. <laughs> I load up the truck and I drive over to Thursdays where I drink with Joe and Stacy and anyone else who make animals by. At some point, Stacy and I steal our way to the back of the bar. So, you were the last one I was with before Joe. And I went and got married, Stacy says. What do you remember? You were a vision, I say. And then I compare everyone I've been with since to you. She smiles. Hey, I say, are you happy? What? She says, why don't you ask us to be fucked up like that? <laughs> I realize that I've messed with the order of things, the way they've been and are supposed to remain. If this rain is going to continue and the end of the world is upon us, maybe it's time to throw a caution to the wind. I want you to meet me tomorrow morning at the cemetery, so I want you to join me for something. In this weather? No. 
I don't know. Maybe? Why? But, good, I said, just come. Take care of what you need to tonight, and then join me in the morning. Okay, she says. I get back into my truck, and I drive through the flooded streets, past the down power lines and trees, the river now crashing over the riverbank as it courses through town. When I get back to the cemetery, I see two garter snakes, a pair of chipmunks, and a couple of horses enjoying the menagerie. <laughs> All standing there stoically despite the storm and the wind buffing them from all sides. I start to work again and the animals keep coming, cows, possums, dogs, and cats. By morning the water from the river is slowly climbing up the hill and towards the cemetery. Still far enough away, but not too much, but close enough. It's almost time to escape. Stacy pulls up in her car and she looks at me, spilled out. Is that what I think it is, she says, stepping out of her car? It is, I say. And you, you are a vision. Are you ready to come with me on a journey? Why not, she says. With that, Stacy joins me on the platform, where she is followed by the animals, two by two. <laughs> the world now underwater, the rain unceasing, and the possibilities endless.